And I'm particularly excited about tonight because, in my opinion, this is one of the most crucial issues on validating Christianity that we can possibly discuss. Um, the, the resurrection of Jesus is absolutely foundational to Christianity. It is not like the sprinkles or the icing on the cake. Um, if Jesus was truly resurrected from the dead, literally, historically, bodily, died, and then was resurrected again to life, I, I, I would suggest that changes everything about the human existence from then on out. Um, likewise, if that didn't happen, then the very, frame, the very foundation of Christianity, in my opinion, crumbles. Because the very found, the, the, I mean, this was something that they said proved that Jesus is God in the flesh. And so uh, even, even Paul the Apostle in the Bible, this is, this is one, the man who wrote a significant portion of the New Testament, said, if only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. And so he, Paul is basically throwing down the gauntlet and saying, if, if this is all a myth, and if, if Jesus wasn't resurrected from the dead, then we are fools. We are believing a myth. We are believing a lie. Likewise, Jesus said himself that, like, uh, he was talking about the Pharisees, and people were saying, oh, give us a sign, give us a sign, you know, give us a miracle to prove that you're God. And he said, you're not going to get a sign except for that of Jonah. I'm going to be gone, for th and Jonah was in the belly for three days. But anyway, he's, they, Jesus basically said, the, the most foundational point to prove that I am who I say I am is I'm going to die and come back to life. And if he didn't do that, if he didn't come back to life, then that changes everything about Christianity. It shows that either Jesus was a liar or he was foolishly mistaken or those words were added in later, in which case he didn't say anything like that and we can't trust the Bible. So I, I would just suggest to you and, and hope that you take it seriously that whether or not this event truly happened in history, literally, historically, and bodily, whether or not Jesus came back from the dead, um, has a dramatic impact on our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, if it did happen, then I'd say it validates Christianity. And if it didn't happen, it completely discredits Christianity, and we, it's nothing more than a, than a self-help philosophy. Um, so with that, I'd just like to introduce our, our contenders for the evening. I have a brief bio for, for each man. Um, so David Wood right here uh, says, David is a former atheist who converted to Christianity after examining the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. He's a member of the Society of Christian Philosophers, the Evangelical Philosophical Society, and the Hume Society, and has participated in more than 30 public debates with representatives of atheism and Islam. You can reach David at his website, act17.net. Um, he will be arguing in, uh, against the motion. He believes that the resurrection, he will be arguing that the resurrection did happen. Uh, once again, the motion of the evening is that the literal resurrection uh, did not happen. So he will be arguing against that. Uh, the man arguing in favor of the motion is going to be Farhan Qureshi, and he is a former Muslim who defended the religion of Islam on the academic stage. He has debated theologians, philosophers, apologists, uh, Christian apologists, uh, thinkers and activists at universities, churches, and on media, media programs. He is now officially an agnostic and is the director of the website beliefrevision.com. He is currently pursuing a doctorate in clinical psychology and has worked in mental health for the past five years. Um, I've seen, I've, I, I've, got, I've met David at a number of events in the past at NYU, and I'm very excited to have him back. It is the first time that I've met Farhan, and I'm very excited that he's uh, you know, donated his time to come and engage us in this way. Um, so, uh, gentlemen, first of all, can you welcome our contenders? Before we get into opening statements, uh, by no means are you identified solely by your past or any conversion experience or anything like that, but nonetheless it is kind of interesting uh, the philosophical framework that you both came from and then changed to something significantly different. So uh, would you mind just, I, I'll give you maybe a minute apiece to say, um, not to say what like the single biggest thing was that changed you from uh, your former philosophical identity to your current stance now. Just to, just to give the audience a flavor of, of who you are personally. Um, well, uh, some of you in here may have had the similar experience. Um, I was an atheist and was uh, persecuting the particular Christian, and uh, I messed with the wrong one one day. And uh, <laughs> this guy schooled me for months, and uh, I eventually started studying uh, Christianity and the resurrection to refute him and 
in order to refute him, I realized I had to come up with some alternative explanation. And some of the facts that we're going to look at tonight, I, I realized there was no alternative explanation other than resurrection. And so uh, there are some other things involved, of course, but that would be the biggest, uh, the biggest issue in my uh, leaving atheism and becoming a Christian. Thank you. Uh, sorry, thank you. Um, well, I was born and raised in the United States, but to a Muslim family, and so, so my identity as a Muslim was, was very precious to me. Um, I, like most people, who become attached to their identity, whether as an American or as an Indian person or a black person, white person, Christian, Muslim, I, I began this process, psychological attachment to my identity as a Muslim. And so I, I wanted it to be true. I really wanted it to be true. I practiced it, I was devout, I loved my family who practiced it. Um, and so I started to defend it, I started to argue for it, I started to challenge other people on their beliefs and why mine would be true. And uh, it was a little bit uh, during undergrad when I started studying psychology and then eventually when I would um, uh, start working in mental health that I saw human suffering for what it was. I uh, began to understand human behavior more empirically. Uh, and uh, as a result, I realized that religion was an indoctrination process, that it was that, it, that people's minds are conditioned and that they are brainwashed, either or, or they convince themselves uh, that the, their worldview is true to, to, the, to the point where it's difficult to see outside of the lines or found them. Otherwise, defense mechanisms, if you will, uh, come into play, uh, denial and whatnot in order to protect the ego from anxiety. And so once I realized that about myself, once I was able to do that, that introspection, um, I, I realized that nobody deserved hell, which is a, a, a eternal suffering and torture and misery. Um, and uh, I, that, that's what led me to the Islam altogether. Thank you. Um, with that, Farhan, you will get the first opening statement. Uh, you'll get eight minutes. From here on out, I will basically be the timekeeper slash questioner. Um, so basically, just so you guys know where we're headed, the first portion of tonight will be uh, opening statements, then, then the next will be questions from myself that we've put together ahead of time for both contenders. Um, then they will, they'll, they'll have a chance to answer, and then there will be a response, as there will be a response for the opening statements. Then the next section will be more of a cross-examination, where I become purely a timekeeper, and they will have an opportunity to ask uh, deliberate questions back and forth to hopefully keep the whoever they are talking to um, on topic. Most of the time, I've, I've seen numerous debates in my life, and a lot of the time, each, each candidate uh, just talks about the issues at hand that he feels is the strongest, and they never actually try to dialogue or dismantle or you know, defeat the opposing statements or the opposing logic. They just dance around where they feel comfortable, and they both accuse the other of not attacking their own view. And so they, they accuse the other of not really digging into the issue. And so the second portion is going to give both of these men an opportunity to keep their opponent on, on track. And they'll both get an opportunity to do that. And the third portion is when you guys will uh, be able to ask your questions. We'll, like I said, we'll collect them, and then uh, I will ask them from, from the front. So uh, without further ado, Farhan, I'd like you to come to the podium, and uh, we'll begin tonight. Yeah, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for coming. Thank you, crew and NYU for hosting this debate. And David Wood, it's always a pleasure to, to, to be with you and to see you again. So I uh, appreciate everybody for, who, uh, for putting this together. Um, this is the first time I'm actually debating the resurrection topic. Uh, I've debated numerous other topics related to Jesus and the Bible, um, problem of evil, philosophical issues, but this is the first time I'm actually having the opportunity to discuss the resurrection. And I, and I think that it's important because the moderator uh, w was absolutely correct that the resurrection is the most crucial topic to prove Christianity. I think it's the only one. Um, I think you might have arguments for or against God, but in terms of Christianity, I think re the resurrection is the big topic. Um, and by the resurrection of, of, of Jesus, what we mean is that Jesus died medically for three days and three nights and then came back to life. That's, that's generally the understanding. But more than, more than anything, more than any other reason that skeptics would reject the resurrection uh, narrative is because of its miraculous nature. Uh, it's more of an issue of whether an event of this kind could, could occur than anything else. Miracles are unbelievable. 
people from primitive societies believed in all sorts of crazy things. Uh, it's therefore no surprise that a resurrection narrative exists, uh, no different than other miracles attributed to mythological beings or individuals uh, within history, whether it's Mithra, Horus, Moses, uh, Dionysus, or others. So there's many uh, miracle myths that are out there. So it's not a surprise that, that such, such a story or a narrative exists. Um, there, there were a few things you know, from when I was a Muslim that, that I still cherish, and this is some of the wisdom gems that you, that you can find perhaps in every religion. Um, but, but, but there was a saying of Muhammad which means that hearsay is not like seeing. Um, and, and I think that that resonates perfectly well with this situation. Um, because, because we weren't there. I wasn't there. I don't know what happened. I don't know what those individuals were possibly witnessing or, or, or thinking when they, when they claimed that they saw Jesus resurrected. Um, I think that there's plenty of natural explanations that can be given, though, for, for, for the events that took place some 2,000 years ago. Um, now, the, for the next thing that I want to point out, that God could have absolutely produced a miracle, being an omnipotent or all-powerful being, uh, for the purpose of people believing, um, he could have, could have done so in a much better and more convincing way than than creating a historical mystery, if you will. I think that there, there, that there could have been something that God could have done better than, 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 than the resurrection uh, 2,000 years ago in primitive Israel. Um, and so the, the, this is the first issue that skeptics will, will, will argue, is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. And I think that, that, that this is an extraordinary claim and therefore the evidence that David provides has to be extraordinary as well. Um, and, and the reason why the resurrection is even called a miracle is because it is so unlikely, it is so improbable that we have to call it a miracle. Um, now, the, 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 the next issue is, is using history as evidence because history is somebody hearing a story from somebody else. And Bart Ehrman is very... Um, Famous for repeating, repeating that he himself is a historian, and he says that you know, if somebody hearing something from somebody who heard some, who heard it from somebody else, 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 uh, and, and that's that's what we're doing here. We're using history in that sense um, as evidence, and not saying that, that that there can be no historical investigation. I think historical investigation is crucial uh, to to us considering what the past might be. I just think that there's better, or skeptics would say that there's better forms of evidence and that God being an omnipotent or all-powerful being should have been able to produce something more, uh, something more convincing in terms of Christianity specifically. Um, now, when we, when we talk about the Bible, um, th th there's some issues about the narratives even within it with the Bible because no, first of all, none of the authors of, of, of the Bible were eyewitnesses, whether it's Paul or the, the four Gospels. None of them, we, we don't know who the authors are. These, these are anonymous titles. Um, the, the individuals who, are, who, are, uh, who witnessed uh, the, the resurrection were lower class fishermen from Galilee. Um, and and so, the, so they weren't very educated. Um, and uh, the, the, the composers of the New Testament, on the other hand, seem to be, uh, and Bart Ehrman is someone who points this out as well, seem to be uh, educated, and highly educated, and, and rhetorically um, uh, professional in their in, in Greek composition. And so this is, we see a difference between the individuals that are writing the Bible in Greek and the original disciples um, and their background. Um, the, the, the next issue is that, it, 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 perhaps I could quote Thomas Paine, who says, uh, in his Age of Reason, I lay down as a, as a position which cannot be uh, controverted first, that, uh, that the agreement of all parts of the story does not prove that the story is true, um, because the parts may disagree and the whole thing might be false. 
and secondly, that the disagreement of the parts of, of a story proves that the whole cannot be true. And that's the, the crucial part that I want us to focus on for a moment, is that the disagreement of the parts of the story proves that the whole thing is probably not true. And, and that's a big issue with biblical inerrancy. And what biblical inerrancy is that the four Gospels are, are, are telling the story quite differently. Um, some of the more famous ones um, in terms of the day and the time that Jesus died, different according to what gospel you may read. Uh, did Jesus carry the cross or did Simon? Different according to the gospel that you might read. Uh, did certain people, uh, or excuse me, did the curtain rip in half uh, before Jesus died or after? Different according to what gospel you may read. Uh, who went to the tomb uh, on the third day? Was it Mary alone or did she go with other women? There, there's a difference in narrative. Um, was the stone rolled away from the tomb before they got there or, or, um, or after? These are differences within the narratives themselves. Um, when when uh, they went to the tomb, um, was it one man, was it two men, or was it an angel? The narratives are different um, in terms of describing this. Um, what were they told uh, to go to stay in Jerusalem or were they told to go to Galilee, Galilee afterwards? Different according to what gospel you may read. And so, with the, with, given that there's different versions of what was going on there uh, in terms of, uh, of, of the historical narrative, because of, the, because of these, so, these significant differences, um, one could wonder how, how accurate the, the narrative is in the first place. And of course, mind you that these are narratives being told uh, some 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 years after they supposedly happened. Mark, would you, would you mind wrapping up? Okay, sure. Um, and so, so, so just, just to wrap up, uh, th th there's an issue with miracles being the least probable occurrence. The fact that miracles have never been verified or falsified brings, it is the major reason why skeptics doubt this resurrection narrative. Um, second is using history as, as evidence. There's better. There's there has to be better evidence in it. Now, omnipotent God should be able to produce better evidence. And then the third is biblical inerrancy, the issue of of of, uh, of, of different types of narr narratives. Um, and the and the last am I, am I wait, yeah. And the last thing I want to point out is that there's many other miracles in the New Testament. Uh, you'll have a chance to rebut his opening statement. Okay. Okay. Sorry. Sorry. Bill, floor is yours. Well, good evening. Um, uh, I'd also like to thank uh, NYU and crew for uh, hosting the debate, debate and uh, Farhan as well uh, for making my task so easy tonight. <laughs> I can tease him. We've, we've been friends for years. Um, Farhan pointed out that the uh, main reason skeptics would have a problem with this is with the resurrection is because it is miraculous in nature. And so I'd like to begin uh, with uh, just a quick question about skepticism. Uh, what is, uh, what is the, the correct form of skepticism? Because I feel like I have the correct degree of skepticism. Um, what I find is that many atheists are skeptical of supernatural explanations, but often very gullible when it comes to natural explanations. So uh, any random explanation, no matter how poorly it fits the facts, as long as it's natural and doesn't appeal to the supernatural, we'll accept it. We'll go for that. No problem. No problem. Oh, that, oh, some matter came together in form like, ah, no problem. Easy. No skepticism whatsoever, and we're going to see this with, uh, with explanations for the data surrounding the resurrection of Jesus. Um, I am skeptical of supernatural explanations. Uh, if you come up to me and say, uh, you know, hey, my friend was sick and I prayed for my friend and he got better. I'm going to think, you know, your, your friend's immune system made him better. And uh, that's probably what happened. Even though I would grant, because I'm a, I'm a Christian, I would grant, hey, it's possible. But, you know, I'm going to think that's pretty unlikely. Um, and given that the person does have an immune system, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to tend towards that. Uh, so I am skeptical of uh, supernatural Explanations, but I'm also very skeptical of natural explanations when they just don't fit the facts. And that's what I found when I uh, came to the resurrection of Jesus. Um, so let's talk about some of the facts first. And there are lots of facts involved here. I'm going to focus 
uh, on two main points. Uh, one, Jesus died, and two, he was alive again after he died. Pretty, uh, pretty straightforward. Jesus died, and he was alive again after he died. And so if you've got that, I'd say you've got a miracle on your hands, and uh, that's what we find in Christianity. Now, there are all kinds of... Um, uh, there are all kinds of lines of evidence for Jesus' death by crucifixion. Um, our, uh, the early sources that we have, multiple sources, multiple independent sources. We have Christian sources, Jewish sources, Roman sources. Uh, everyone agrees that Jesus died by crucifixion. Uh, this isn't disputed. If Farhan wants to dispute it, we can, we can go into some of, uh, we can go into some of the, the evidence. Um, but I'll just point out, given uh, what we know from history and the historical sources and what we know about Roman crucifixion, uh, this is not disputed at a scholarly level, and I'll quote some, uh, a couple of non-Christian um, scholars here just to give you an idea of what even non-Christian scholars say about Jesus' death by crucifixion. Um, atheist New Testament scholar Gerd Ludemann says that Jesus' death as a consequence of crucifixion is indisputable. So it's not, hey, we have some good evidence for it. It's indisputable, historically. Uh, John Dominic Crossan of the notoriously liberal Jesus Seminar says that there is, quote, not the slightest doubt about the fact of Jesus' crucifixion under Pontius Pilate, and he adds uh, that he was crucified is as sure as anything historical can ever be. And uh, since Barham brought up Bart Ehrman, I'll be quoting Bart Ehrman here and there. Um, Bart Ehrman says, one of the most certain facts of history is that Jesus was crucified on orders of the Roman prefect of Judea, Pontius Pilate. So notice, these guys aren't saying, uh, well, we have some reason to believe it, or, you know, history is a really weak tool, maybe we have some reason to, to think that Jesus might have died or something like that. They're saying, indisputable, one of the best established facts of history, period. So Jesus' death by crucifixion isn't, uh, isn't the, the real issue. The issue is whether he was alive again later. And Christians appeal to various arguments here, uh, arguments for the empty tomb, arguments from uh, fulfilled prophecies, and so on. Uh, I'm just going to stick with appearances because that's, that's why I became uh, Christian. Uh, also at the scholar level, just as there's no dispute about uh, Jesus' death by crucifixion, there's no dispute about whether the apostles uh, had experiences that they believed were appearances of Jesus. So people like Ehrman and, and others don't believe that Jesus actually appeared to the apostles, but uh, scholars in general at least grant that the apostles were convinced uh, to the point of being willing to die uh, that Jesus had appeared to them. I'll give a couple of quotations here. Uh, Gerrit Ludemann again uh, says, it may be taken as historically certain that Peter and the disciples had experiences after Jesus' death in which Jesus appeared to them as the risen Christ. Paula Fredrickson said, I know in their own terms what they saw was the raised Jesus. I'm not saying that they really did see the raised Jesus. I wasn't there. I don't know what they saw, that's what Farhan just said. But I do know as a historian that they must have seen something. And Bart Ehrman once again, for it is a historical fact that some of Jesus' followers came to believe that he had been raised from the dead soon after his execution. And Ehrman also believes these uh, followers had experiences that they believe were appearances of the risen Jesus. Uh, so, the question, and I'll, I'll just stick with, with that data, I'll just add uh, two interesting uh, components to the appearances. Uh, some of those appearances were to uh, enemies of Christianity. So Jesus' uh, half-brother James was uh, rejected Jesus during his uh, earthly life, and soon after uh, Jesus' death, James comes back and starts preaching, even to the point where he was eventually stoned to death for preaching, uh, preaching the gospel. And the Apostle Paul, of course, who was an early persecutor in the church, tried to wipe out Christianity, uh, also uh, started preaching Christianity, started preaching the gospel based on the claim that he had seen the risen Jesus. So both friends and foes claimed that Jesus had appeared to them. And let's just stick with that data. There's more, but let's stick with that data since time is short. What's the best explanation for these facts? Um, lots of people, I believe, die for things that aren't true. But when we turn to the apostles of Jesus, it's very different. If I die today for something I believe in, it's because I heard it from someone and I happen to believe it and then I go out you know, and I, I believe it so firmly I'm willing to die for it. Uh, the apostles were not dying for some message that they heard from someone. They were dying for something they claimed they saw with their own eyes. 
And given how these men went to their bloody deaths, proclaiming that they had seen the risen Jesus, we have to ask ourselves, what convinced them? What gave them that degree of confidence that they were uh, willing to die for this? And we can ask that question about anyone who dies for what they believe, but with these men in particular, it was about something they had seen. So what did they see that convinced them to the point that they're willing to go to their bloody desk proclaiming that they had seen this man risen from the dead? And the only explanation I could ever come up with when I was examining this was that they actually saw the risen Jesus. Farhan says he has plenty of naturalistic explanations. I would love to see them because uh, I haven't found any that even come close to uh, explaining this in any coherent way. Um, but uh, at the end of the day, uh, Farhan is right. The only, I mean, the, the main reason that people would reject this is because of some allegiance to naturalism or to just because we reject miracles uh, in general. And the problem here is, I mean, naturalism as a worldview is falling apart. It doesn't account for the origin of the universe. It doesn't account for fine tuning. It doesn't account for biological complexity. It doesn't account for human consciousness. It doesn't account for uh, the reliability of human reasoning abilities. It doesn't account for laws of logic. It doesn't account for moral laws. It's falling apart. And uh, I think somewhere in here I'll quote uh, one of your professors at NYU, who's a world-class uh, philosopher who just came out with a book saying that uh, within about two generations, he believes that uh, naturalism, as it's taught today, is going to be uh, 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 something that people laugh at because of how rapidly uh, it's disintegrated. But if naturalism just doesn't account for our world, then we can't rule out uh, supernatural explanations of phenomena. And if we're going to allow supernatural explanations, then I think you have to allow one here. Thank you. Farah, your, your rebuttal to his opening statements. All right, thanks, David. And so, so the, what, one of the things that he says is, um, what, why were these disciples willing to die for? But what caused their confidence? And what, was it something that they saw? And, and did that happen to be the resurrection? Well, what we know through group psychology is that it doesn't have to be one particular uh, incident. Um, we have to understand that these were individuals that were traveling with Jesus, that, that, that they were absolutely overwhelmed and, uh, and rebellious against um, the Roman rule at the time, and so they so they were they had this emotional and political um, connection there. It, it says it, it said that the fishermen were were absolutely treated unfairly by these Roman rulers. The the the, the, the fish that they would catch for, for, for the for the for the people um, was not compensated, and so these people were upset by their situation. Um, and here comes a rabbi. Who's, or somebody who's professing to be a rabbi, um, and, and, he, and he's gathering these individuals up for, for, for a very long period of time. So there's this social, psychological connection there. And so it's not just an incident of seeing the resurrection, all of a sudden they're willing to die for this. Rather, this is something that was psychologically conditioned. They were convinced um, uh, that, that, that Jesus was the Messiah and what he was claiming. And so this is more than just an, an issue of just witnessing a resurrection. In terms of naturalism failing in, 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 in numerous areas, uh, it's not it, it, an issue of simply being naturalist worldview. It's an issue of what can be what, what, what can be verified and falsified empirically. We know what the laws of physics are. We know what the laws of biology are. We know what the laws of physics are because we can verify and falsify these things. Miracles cannot be verified and falsified, and therefore, we must be skeptical of any claim of, 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 of a miracle um, that cannot be verified or falsified in that sense. So, so this is an issue of the scientific method. It's not an issue of, of a philosophical world view. Um, now, in terms of, 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 of what they had seen, I agree. I, I, I agree with David that, that the disciples must have experienced something or saw something, but it's also possible that, that uh, through, through social psychological phenomena such as the misinformation effect, and you guys can look that up on your own time, um, that these people simply convinced themselves that they were seeing something, while certain, certain others may have been, for example, hallucinating. And, and what, what do we mean by hallucination? Obviously, when we talk about seeing something, uh, whether in the external world, we're talking about uh, light that hits, that goes through the retina and creates a, a, a vision inside of the brain. If the, if the external stimuli is not there, we know that it's variant brain chemistry 
that, that that's causing it. That's the only two explanations that we can have for, for vision. But my time is up. All right. David, you're about to do this opening statements. All right. Um, Farhan says that uh, miracles cannot be verified and falsified by this kind of investigation. And my question is, who says so? Um, I, I mean, are we just laying that down as a rule? I don't, I don't agree with that. So if he has some reason to believe that, I, I'd love to hear it. And uh, I'm going to ask, um, if we're laying this down, how could God ever do anything to convince us? I mean, imagine if God appeared to us right now striking lightning bolts and so on. It would be open to us to say, wow, that David Blaine's really uh, boning up on his magic here. Uh, aliens are really messing with us now. We could explain it in all kinds of ways, even if it, you know, God is here in all kinds of glory and telling us what to believe. If we're going to be that skeptical to where we're just going to go with any alternative, uh, we could never uh, believe in God unless he just programmed us to and didn't give us any kind of option. Uh, so if we're going to have some kind, if we're going to be a little more open to uh, these kinds of truths, then I would say we, we have to uh, have a different methodology. Um, now for Hans, alternative, his naturalistic alternative, and I'm assuming he came out with his best one, right? He, didn't, he obviously didn't come with one that's like 50th down on his list of good alternatives. Assuming he came with his best one, and his explanation was that uh, the disciples were upset. They're really sad. Um, they were psychologically conditioned to believe that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus gets crucified, and uh, perhaps they convinced themselves that they had seen something. Now, this is the obvious route you'd want to go if you're trying to explain uh, the appearances uh, to the disciples, and this absolutely fails. I mean, it fails horribly. If you wanted to explain one appearance to one person and say, maybe this person just felt really, really bad uh, and started having hallucinations, uh, maybe. Once you add that this person goes to his horrible, bloody death, well, now you're granting that he has 10, 20 years to be thinking back, did I really see Jesus? Did I really, really see that? Am I absolutely sure because I'm about to be skinned alive, as Bartholomew was. I'm about to be skinned alive and crucified for proclaiming this. Did I really, really see that, or was I just feeling bad? Uh, and then when you add to that that it wasn't one guy, it was a whole bunch of guys. In fact, our earliest source is an early uh, Christian creed that was the original proclamation uh, of the church, 500 people at one time. So it wasn't one, it wasn't two, it wasn't even 12, it was around 500 people at one time. And when you add to that, that it wasn't people who were conditioned to believe that, it wasn't just people who were conditioned to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, it was also people like the Apostle Paul, who wanted to do anything he could to destroy Christianity, and James, who during his brother's lifetime thought he was insane. These aren't the sort of people who are going to have these kinds of uh, grief visions or hallucinations. And so, does this account for the facts? It doesn't even account for the basic facts, and I gave the bare minimum. I gave the bare minimum of facts. And Farhan's naturalistic explanation just doesn't fit the facts. What does fit the facts, well, if we rule out Farhan's uh, methodology, um, then what do we have? We have only so far the resurrection, an actual miracle fits the facts. And if it comes down to whether I'm going to go with a supernatural explanation that fits all the facts and explains them versus a natural explanation that doesn't fit any of the facts, uh, I'm going with the supernatural explanation. Uh, David, you can actually stay up there. Um, that concludes the opening statement, so now we'll move into the, the first question period. Uh, so, David, uh, the Bible is the main source of knowledge about the resurrection. Christians claim the Bible is true because it is the Word of God, and we know it's the Word of God because the Bible says so. Doesn't this circular logic undermine the validity of truth we hear about the resurrection? Well, so some people actually do use that, use that argument. Um, I, I don't. Um, I, I, I came to believe in the resurrection uh, of Jesus, and I came to believe in Christianity before I actually believed in the Bible, right? Belief in the Bible came later for me. Um, when I was reading the Bible, I was treating it, oh, okay, here's a, here's a collection of first century documents. So here's a collection of first century documents, um, and it was based on that. It was based on that, treating it as historical documents, which is what any good, reputable scholar will say, whether it's Bart Hammond or anyone else. Uh, these are the first century documents. And they're historical documents. These are first century Greco-Roman biographies. So as far as my own thinking, it was here, let's see what I can establish from these historical documents. Then I came to believe in the resurrection. And then 
after believing the resurrection, believing, okay, this is God's sort of central work and sign in history, obviously he's going to want to preserve this, and so you, you eventually get to uh, preservation um, and inspiration uh, of scriptures. But you don't, you don't, I wouldn't start, uh, I wouldn't start with belief in the, uh, in the, uh, in the, in the inspiration. Some, some, some do. Um, I, again, I came from, a, from an atheistic background. I would regard that as, as, a, as, a, as kind of circular there. Um, but the resurrection doesn't, doesn't, depend, um, uh, doesn't depend on presupposing um, belief in the, in the uh, inspiration of scripture. It's, uh, um, notice I appeal to facts that scholars in general, uh, like people like Mark Ehrman and so on, and what's the best explanation of facts. And, uh, so, but anyway, that's just my uh, other people have, a, have an argument for for scripture like that. There are different arguments you can give. Um, but again, for me, uh, started with the miracle and then working out from that central miracle, which can be investigated historically. Hey. Uh, yes. Uh, Farhan, you'll get a chance to respond and then you'll, you'll answer a question of your own. Uh, just so the audience is on the same page, they, they've mentioned Bart Ehrman a number of times, and he's one of the most respected um, non-Christian historical scholars uh, alive today, arguably. Um, he has studied the New Testament extensively, and um, he's, he's personally uh, uh, in, he's a, he's very skeptical, and so he's, he's a very extensive debater. Um, and so, yeah, just, just so, you know. Um, so you're, uh, you, you'll have about a minute to respond to his, his answer to the first question. Uh, yeah, just a note on Bob Bart Ehrman. He was actually a, a devout Christian who went through seminary as well, and due to the problem of, of uh, evil and suffering, um, as he cites it, um, decided to have a change of, of belief. Uh, and, and I think that's that's very important too, because he, David here was an atheist, I was a Muslim, and there was a radical transformation in terms of belief revision, which is what what, what I'm focused on nowadays. Uh, is what, what philosophically what is causing belief update, belief revision. You can see that on my website, beliefrevision.com. Um, but in response to what David said in terms of circular reasoning and using the Bible as a primary um, evidence uh, for the historical resurrection of Christ, I, I would say that that, that that to me is a problem. Um, it, it's, it's furthermore a problem in terms of how the, the date and in terms of which the, the narrative mm -hmm. were being told. The inerrancy that, that I mentioned in my opening statement, the contradictory, um, the, the contradictory um, statements that are there in the four gospels, and so um, I mean I obviously do think that it's an issue, and I do see somewhat of a circular reading. I think that there might be some extra biblical uh, accounts that that talk about the crucifixion uh, event, but I don't think that they they get elaborate enough in terms of uh, post mortem appearances. Uh, Farhan, you can actually remain at the podium. Uh, this question is for you. So, many early Christians were willing to be put to death because they would not recant that they had seen Jesus alive again, uh, including, as he mentioned, uh, people who were not associated with Jesus, such as his enemies, uh, such as the Apostle Paul, who later had a belief revision. Um, so, even his enemies were willing. Why would they do this if they fabricated the events? Well, I mean, again, when we look at cults and we look at social psychology for David Koresh, for example, or Charles Manson, for example, 300 people, um, there, there was mass suicide, okay, there was mass suicide, um, because, and you look at Muslims who are, who are blowing themselves up in the Middle East, it's no surprise that people would kill themselves for what they, would, what, what they believe in. So, so I do think that they were utterly convinced that, that, that Jesus was this great Messiah and everything. But it's not a surprise that they were willing to die for it. Uh, I think that that's conceivable. Um, in terms of Paul, um, the, the, there, there's a the, there's my theory is that that he was suffering from temporal lobe epilepsy. I think that he was having hallucinations. Um, clearly, he was seeing things that other people were not. There, there was just uh, extreme pain that went along with his um, visions. Um, and so I think, in, in, in addition to that. Uh, I think that it's possible that he, he started to uh, psychologically go down and depressed because of all the persecuting that he, he did towards Christians and seeing how faithful the Christians were and, and even how righteous they were, um, he, he might have been emotionally struck by that. So I think that there is a psychological explanation for, 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 for this type of behavior. Hey. David, your response? Oh uh, yeah, now we actually have a combination, combination hypothesis, right? Uh, because Farhan wanted to explain the beliefs of the disciples of Jesus' original followers uh, through some kind of uh, 
uh, conditioning and grief hallucinations. And now, in order to explain the Apostle Paul, who obviously uh, wasn't conditioned to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, uh, we have temporal lobe epilepsy to explain the appearances to Paul. So it's, uh, it's just very interesting, and we, we have to toss James in there, so we can toss in, I guess, some, some epilepsy or uh, some kind of other hallucination there. It's just interesting that with respect to Jesus, this is the one that just everyone's hallucinating about. Hundreds of people all just start uh, having epilepsy and, and having these uh, grief hallucinations and so on. Um, is there such a thing as a natural miracle? I mean, it's just something so inexplicable on natural on naturalistic terms that we have to say, wow, that is so improbable, that, that must be a natural miracle. There's no way all that, all of that came together. So Farhan is saying that, uh, that the supernatural explanation uh, that Christians are using is just unbelievable because uh, it's so miraculous in nature. Well, Farhan, I think that, that, that when you're putting that many improbable things together into one, uh, you've got a natural miracle on your hands, and I'd say uh, that's worthy of skepticism as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, all right, you can retake it. This, this question is for you. So, why do you think most Christians still believe the resurrection to be literally true? If reason and logic cannot lead one to, which I'm, I'm assuming you would agree with the statement, it, it is not logical and reasonable to believe this literally happened. So, if, if reason and logic cannot lead one to trust that it actually happened, what is the main reason they still do so? Uh, again, I would give a psychological explanation for it. I think that they want Christianity be, to be true. Um, I think that it's consolatory. I think it gives them inspiration. I think it gives them meaning in life. Um, and, and that is something that's very difficult to give up because if there isn't a God, then what do I have to live for? What about all the things that the suffering that I've been through? Am I not going to be rewarded in the afterlife? I think these are existential issues that each and every, and every human being has. And, uh, and, and so religion is it's consolatory in that sense. Um, but I do think that there are, there are a number of Christians, don't get me wrong, who, who, do, who have intellectually pursued um, uh, Christianity and that the resurrection is the strongest argument in their mind for the, for, for, as evidence for, for, for Jesus, uh, for the Jesus narrative. And, and I do admit that that's possible. Yeah, you, can, you can cease talking whenever you want. You have, you have a few more minutes if you'd like to. Oh, uh, three minutes? Yeah, uh, each, each, I should have described it. I could go back to what Dave was talking about earlier. I don't know if that would do justice to this question. You can use your time however you'd like. You okay. Have, you have about another two minutes. So, okay. yeah, the questioner gets about three minutes, and then the response is a single one. So you can use your time however you'd like. Yeah, I mean, in terms of that question, I think that, that, that it's perfectly acceptable to have a psychological explanation for why somebody would be Christian. Um, but, but what he was, he was talking about earlier was mass hallucination. Um, I, I, I doubt the 500 number. I, I, I'm not sure if we can historically verify that there was hundreds of people who were, who were seeing this. Um, I think that that's what's in the narrative. And just like we have the discrepancy in, uh, in terms of, you know, of what was going on in between the four Gospels, I think this number could have been made up. There's another incident where, where hundreds of people were actually resurrected. It wasn't Jesus. Uh, it just wasn't Jesus, and their tombs were wide open, and, and you had hundreds of zomb zombie-like, I don't know, resurrections. Um, and this is in the biblical narrative that, that talks about 500 people witnessing this as well. And, so, and there's no historical evidence for this. Um, and so the, the, it's possible that certain individuals were hallucinating like Paul. Paul. I mean, obviously, if you're seeing things and hearing things that other people are not, we, underst we understand, and that's what I work in mental health, that, that we, we, we define this as, halluc as auditory and visual hallucination. There's no other way to explain it. Right. David, you have a minute to respond? Um, Farhan said he doubts the 500 number. It's, it's important to keep in mind that that's not even in the Gospels. It comes from a, a, much, early, a much earlier source. That comes from the, the Creed. The Creed is recorded in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but it's actually uh, much earlier. So if you want the earliest passage in the New Testament, it's, it's a creed at the beginning of 1 Corinthians uh, 15, verses 3 through 7. And uh, that's where we come up with the number. And why is that important? Because uh, even critical scholars will date this creed to within two years of Jesus' death and resurrection. So uh, if this is circulating in two years, and this is on the list of witnesses, these, these 500 people, uh, certainly not something that would, uh, I mean, would have obviously been uh, exposed as a lie pretty quickly. Uh, the hundreds of zombie-like people, uh, the Bible doesn't give any number of the, the people that were 
that were um, raised. Uh, but it's an interesting point. It's, it doesn't say hundreds or anything like that. Um, it, it's an interesting point because that does come from uh, a later source, much later than the Creed, that comes from the book of Matthew. So I'm coming at this critically. I'm coming at this critically. Farhan is putting all of this on the same, uh, everything in the Bible on kind of the same level. Um, I'm looking at this saying, wait a minute, you're, you're quoting one source. I'm quoting uh, the earliest, the absolute earliest material, material that is, that is confirmed even by critical scholars. And uh, the difference between, say, resurrection or, or the raising of certain people, the raising of Jesus, is the sheer number of sources and the sheer number of witnesses. And that's why we point to that miracle. I believe the other miracles occurred. But as far as what we have evidence for, we just have vastly more evidence uh, for the resurrection of Jesus. And uh, I don't think that's a coincidence, given that's the, that's the cornerstone of Christianity. Thank you. Uh, you can actually remain at the podium. This question is for you again. You have three minutes to respond. The scientific method used to uh, discern and, and unveil truth as we know it today relies on observable, repeatable tests. Since the resurrection fits neither criteria, shouldn't it be rejected in the same way we, we would reject anything else that is nowadays not observable or repeatable in science? Um, well, we're talking, we're talking history here. Uh, the scientific method is the scientific method, and not even everything in science is actually, actually used as the scientific method. When we're talking about the scientific method, we're talking usually about things you do in the laboratory, you perform an experiment, you gather your data, um, you, you formulate a hypothesis that accounts for the data, then you formulate more tests to go and explore that data. Uh, I mean, more tests to test your hypothesis and see if it's confirmed or disconfirmed. You can do that in a laboratory, but you can't even do that with, with, uh, with various things in science. If you're talking about um, the formation of the universe, you're not talking about repeatable experiments that you say, okay, let's try it over and over again and, and see if we come up with the same thing. If you're talking about uh, the history of the world or uh, the history of evolution or something like that, um, you can, you know, these aren't things that you do in a laboratory, you, you repeat your steps in that way. Um, but I, I believe that, that, that the heart, the heart of testing hypotheses, uh, even though it's not the, it's not the same as the full-blown historical uh, scientific method that you use in the laboratory, uh, the kind of heart of testing hypotheses uh, does apply in other areas, whether it's to uh, historical events or to scientific um, phenomena, namely that uh, you form a hypothesis that, supposed, that, that is going to account for the data. You, you try to say, I want a hypothesis, I want an explanation that accounts for what I'm trying to explain. And if it does, if it accounts for it, then it's, it's a good explanation, and you look for other, if there's any disconfirming evidence, and you look for competing hypotheses, because sometimes you can come up with multiple hypotheses uh, that account for the same data, and then you try and come up with tests to see uh, which, one, uh, which one is confirmed. Um, so applying that, applying that, that method of hypothesis confirmation to the resurrection, we have our data. We have data to work with. There's no shortage of data. We even have data that uh, are, are agreed upon by uh, both Christians and non-Christians. And so the method I've laid out is, here's the data, what accounts for it. Um, and I just, it's obvious that the resurrection accounts for why every shred of evidence we have tells us Jesus died and every shred of evidence we have tells us he was alive again after he died. The resurrection fits that very, very well. Um, the alternatives, if we're going to um, start appealing to mass hallucinations and uh, uh, epilepsy and so on, uh, if you're going to do that, you could, exp I mean, you could explain anything, right? Um, you could explain anything like that. You could explain anything in history like that. Neil Armstrong walked on the moon. No, he didn't. They all had hallucinations. I mean, how, how, how powerful is that? But one, I mean, it's so improbable uh, that we would have to reject it based on its sheer improbability. And two, uh, I, it still doesn't even account, it still doesn't even account for the data. Um, it, you know, I, I, you, you, you might know people who uh, hallucinated they saw their grandma. Uh, a couple of years later, if it comes down to, I'm about to be tortured to death over this, the person's going to be wondering, did I really see grandma or something like that? And with the disciples, it's to the man, down to a man. It would be different if half of them were ready to go to their desk and the other half had doubts. It's down to a man. Everyone, no one had anything but complete confidence that they had seen the risen Lord. And you just don't explain that with uh, hallucinations or epilepsy. Thank you. Barlon, you have a minute to respond uh, to his, his answer about scientific observability and repeatability in this topic. 
Sure. Yeah, I mean, d during my opening statement, I said that there could have been a better, a better an omnipotent God could produce a, a better way of, a more convincing way to, 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 to establish himself to, to humanity. Um, and, and so I do think that, that perhaps something scientific would be superior to, to, uh, to, to, to the histor historical event 2,000 years ago, particularly in a primitive society that was susceptible to all kinds of beliefs. Um, and particularly in a, in a very low educated, um, particularly low educated aspect of that culture. Um, could, could, there, could there have been something superior to in terms of science? Yes, but I think that it would be even better if, if our generation, who, through, the, through the generation of, that has technology and broadcast ability, to be able to witness something like that, and, and that that would be something that would be far more powerful, and God, being an omnipotent being, should be able to produce that. Thank you. All right, uh, I'd like to <clears throat> thank both of you for that first question period. Now we're going to move on to the more cross-examination period, where um, one person will get a chance to, as to the best extent of their ability, speak in nothing but questions. Uh, feel free to word an objection with a question mark at the end, however artfully you want, but but I encourage you to speak only in questions um, to keep your opponent um, on, on topic. And then after after six minutes of that, you will get a, whoever is asking the questions will get a chance to respond however they like with words for about two minutes um, to answer the answers that they just heard. Um, so David, you, you are the questioner first. So uh, I, I, at this point, I'm simply time to answer. So begin. Uh, yes, Rahan, if we're going to assume from the beginning that a naturalistic explanation is always going to be better than a supernatural explanation, can you think of something God could do apart from programming us to uh, believe in him? Is there some miracle that God could perform that we just absolutely could not attribute to some natural explanation? Well, I mean, if, if, because God is a supernatural being, I would imagine that, that God could produce supernatural. If God exists, God would be a supernatural being and would be able to produce supernatural. But, I mean, could you, could you come up with some any sign any that God could give to us right now that we could not, by any stretch of the imagination, attribute to something natural? I think, I, I think a resurrection in, in today's day and age would, would be phenomenal. Um, I think any of the miracles that are attributed to Moses or Noah in a day of technology where we have cameras and, and ways to document. But given given that we do have a superior technology, wouldn't it be easier to explain away the appearance of a miracle? No, I think if a person is medically dead and comes back to life and people are clearly seeing him, um, that, that would be that would But couldn't you just say, um, obviously everyone is in on some sort of some sort of fabrication. Right, so that they're making up a broadcast. Or could you say that an, an alien came and, and, and did this? Could you say that? I mean, I don't know whether I would fall to include that an alien. I've never seen an alien, so I don't know. But, <laughs> but it would be natural. It would be a natural explanation. I'm sorry, just to cut you off. Uh, you, you've cut off his words a number of times, so just to be oh, fair. Yeah, so that, that. Uh, yeah, you can, they you do can, that all the time in court. Yeah, oh, I don't, I don't believe it, but just, just to be fair to each side, we, we'd like him to be able to finish the sentence uh, before the next question follow, okay. follows up on that thought. No, I think that God should be able to produce a supernatural miracle that is convincing to each and every one of us. If that's his purpose, if, if miracle producing is what God must do to convince us, then I think that there's, there's probably better ways than just miracle production, too. What would, what would some better ways be to convince us that God exists? Um, sub subjective revelation. What, 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 can you give us some examples? Personally coming down to each and every person um, and, and, and having communication with that person. How could we not attribute that to hallucination or to aliens or to someone trying to trick us or anything like that? Well, I mean, I, I, I'm definitely a person who, who doesn't discount hallucinations. I think that there, there could be some reality to, to, to hallucinations that people are seeing. And I think that there's certain mystics and, and psychiatrists that would agree with that. So I'm not, I'm not against hallucinations being, you know, just dismissing hallucinations. I think that they could be, they could have profound revelation. But in terms of, I think that there's a wide range of hallucinations and they, they symbolize different things to different people. 
Uh, Farhan, you said uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. Uh, do you see why some people might regard uh, explaining all of the appearances, both to some friends and foe, as uh, hallucinations that, that gave them such confidence they're willing to go to their, their bloody desk? Um, can you see why some people would regard that in itself as an extraordinary claim, that there was that level of hallucination? Well, I mean, I, I would wonder what the level of hallucination that we're talking about is, how many people were included. I think, like I said, that's a 500 number, even if it's in Paul's writing, Paul wasn't there. Um, who, who did he hear it from? There's no verification in the four Gospels of that number. Um, and there's, for, for example, there's nothing about the empty tomb in Paul's narratives either. Um, there's talk about his resurrection, but the empty tomb complete, happens to be completely, that Paul was completely silent on. And so there's issues in terms of the biblical narrative. And I, I, I would wonder how many people were actually convincing themselves or hallucinating in this scenario. So suppose we go with kind of the lowest number, let's say uh, 11 apostles, uh, 11 followers of Jesus, uh, plus James and plus Paul. Um, can you see why some of us, myself included, would regard the claim that these 13 people all became so convinced that Jesus appeared to them, uh, not seeing some foggy vision, but so convinced that he had appeared to them and had given them commands that they go to their bloody deaths, um, attributing this to Greek hallucinations um, or epilepsy. You see why some people would regard that as an extraordinary claim, extraordinary. No, I mean, I can see what you're, I, don't, don't get me wrong, Dave, I, I completely understand what you're saying in terms of, you know, the, the, the numbers here. But I think that, that there have been examples in history, in, in India in particular, where where, it, where several individuals have seen, for example, the guru were levitating. There's several stories of that kind. Um, there, there, is, there are examples of organized schizophrenia and schizotypal individuals in bear matter of fact. Harold Camping was one of the most recent ones. Um, what, what they didn't necessarily hallucinate, but that doesn't mean, but, but we're, we're talking about people who have variant brain chemistry that cause hallucinations coming together uh, to form cults. That is something that we do know and, and have researched. Do you know of other examples where you had sort of friends and foes all coming together, uh, hallucinating about the same person and then going to their deaths for the confidence of this and still them? Or is this kind of a unique? I mean, I think that they were all pretty much friends. I think James was the only foe that we know of. I mean, Paul came a lot later, but J J James was the only one, and he was, he was J Jesus' brother. Um, so, so there was there was some emotional connection there. All right, uh, thank you. Uh, David, your response to what he's just saying? You have, um, you have three minutes. Well, I, I, again, I'll, you say three minutes? Uh, actually, let's say the time can I make it to. Sure, sure, sure. Um, yeah, um, I asked Farhan for an example of, I asked him for several times for an example of something that God could do where we couldn't, uh, we, we still wouldn't believe it if we we're going to use this, uh, we can just spout any naturalistic explanation we want and that's going to be more believable. Again, if that's our methodology, nothing God could ever do would ever convince us. And so, if your methodology that you're using from the very beginning makes it so that even if God exists, there is absolutely nothing an all-powerful being could do to convince you of something, then I'd say you've got a flawed methodology, right? It sounds like you're, you're deliberately ruling that sort of thing out from the beginning as part of your methodology so you can never even get to the truth. I mean, think about it. Farhan would, would grant the possibility of the existence of, uh, of some being like God, and yet, following the methodology he has, there's nothing that being could ever do to convince him of it. And so, if it's possible that being exists, obviously we should have a methodology that allows us to discover that he exists. But using his current methodology, we can never, uh, we can never do that. Um, uh, as far as the other issue that we discussed, uh, whether his claim that uh, you know maybe these guys got together and. Um, they were having some kind of hallucinations, and they have this this brain chemistry, and uh, you know the Apostle Paul comes along later, and so on. Uh, maybe that maybe this is a combination of epilepsy and, and hallucinations. Uh, I mean, just think. I mean, what are the odds? If you said one guy, if you said one guy was so nuts, was so nuts that he went to his bloody death 
uh, based on something he saw, that would be one thing. When it's everyone who is there, and they're all saying the exact same thing, and it's both friends and foes, uh, it's people who uh, were devout followers of Jesus and people who were devout enemies of Jesus, and they all see the same thing and go to their bloody deaths, um, I think you've just pushed the limits, I think you've pushed the limits of, uh, of believability uh, with these natural explanations. Thank you. All right, Farhan, now, now it's your opportunity. You'll have six minutes to ask nothing but questions of David. Um, well, my first question, really quick, is the Bible talks about several miracles. The resurrection is the only miracle that, that it speaks of. Um, uh, for example, Jesus walking on water, curing the blind, curing the leprosy, you know, this mass, uh, resurrection in, in Israel. Would you agree that all of these other, virgin birth is another one, would you agree that all of these other um, miracles of the New Testament you know, talks about have, have no historical evidence for that whatsoever? I believe they do have historical evidence. They don't have the same kind of historical evidence that we have for the resurrection. So um, if we talk about uh, you know, Jesus walking on the water, we have that in the Gospels. The Gospels are first century uh, greco roman biographies. So you have some sources reporting at least that people in the first century were claiming that they have seen that. That's some, that's some evidence. That's some historical evidence. Um, but that's different from the evidence we have with Jesus, where the, the information is so early and so widely attested that even critical scholars are granting the core facts of the resurrection without, without admitting the miraculous. They're granting all the facts that the, the claim of the miracle is based on. You don't have, for instance, Mark Ehrman granting, uh, hey, Jesus was there. He was on the water. We don't know how to explain it. You don't have that sort of thing, but you do have that with the, with the resurrection, granting at least the, the facts that it's based on. Well, I mean, with the resurrection, you have several people. This uh, grant, you have several people claiming they believe and we're seeing that these poor, poor, more and more experiences. But these other miracles, such as Jesus walking on water, you don't have numerous people attesting to this. You, you just simply have the narrative, and that's saying. So, how does how does the narrative narrative itself act as evidence for, for that Jesus actually walked on water, or or? Um, that there was a mass uh, resurrection. Oh, well I, well, I understand that, and, and I'll go ahead and say, if I didn't believe in the resurrection and therefore didn't believe in Christianity, I wouldn't believe any of these stories. Right. What, what, I was, what I was denying, your first question was, uh, you, you said, I deny that, I say that there's no historical evidence for them. Would I agree that there's no historical evidence for them? I would agree that there, that there is some, but uh, going back to something I said earlier, I would put it in a, in a kind of progression, right? We can examine the core facts of the resurrection of Jesus, and we can we can we can learn that Jesus rose from the dead. Given that he rose from the dead, now I'm going to uh, one trust the followers a bit more because if someone just rose from the dead, you're going to be trying pretty hard to preserve uh, other things that this person did and his message. And if you have now a miracle, then that's where inspiration comes along. This is something God is doing. God is obviously going to want to preserve this message for future generations if He's doing this kind of work, and therefore. Uh, I would expect God to be somehow involved in the preservation of the material. So, uh, for me, it's, uh, this isn't true of everyone, but, but, but it starts with the resurrection. No, I mean, I, like I said, I understand why the Christians are arguing the resurrection as a, as a historical uh, as a, a historical evidence. But, but you, you do agree that there's no argumentation for these other miracles that, that elaborate with that, as you do with the resurrection. You could, you could make an argument for them. You could say, look, uh, you know, the feeding of the 5,000, it occurs, in, it occurs in all the Gospels. Therefore, you have multiple independent uh, testimony to this, uh, to this miracle of Jesus. You could, you could argue that, um, but uh, I, I, if, if I weren't persuaded by the resurrection, no, I wouldn't be persuaded of these, these other miracles. In other words, I would say, okay, you guys agreed, and, and, and so what? I don't, I don't believe it. And yeah, that's why you don't have a lot of Christian apologists saying that, okay, Jesus walking on water is evidence for Christianity or or, uh, or Jesus curing uh, Lazarus of leprosy is evidence for Christianity because he's not like historical evidence for it. Resurrection seems to be a little bit different because it was, it's something that, that multiple people were claiming to have seen. Um, would you, would you, okay, now when, you, when we talk about hallucinations, if somebody were to come to you and say to you um, that they're seeing things or seeing dead people, like in the sixth sense, or um, yeah, they're, they're having these visits from angels, um, or, or some, some, something to, the, to, to this extent, would you not say that this person is having auditory or visual hallucinations from a psychiatric position, and to say that any other that, that anything other than auditory and visual hallucinations 
which is in Jesus' case, would be would fall to the logical um, the, the, the logical policy known as special pleading, which means that in all other circumstances it's hallucination, but this one it's not. If someone said uh, that angels were uh, were appearing to him, it would certainly be one option that this person is hallucinating, uh, or that this person is lying. But I happen to believe in angels, so I would have to grant that as a possibility. Um, I wouldn't. Uh, I wouldn't. I wouldn't believe that it was necessarily that it was hallucination. I wouldn't necessarily believe that it was uh, from God if the circumstances were radically changed to where it was. Many people all saying they saw the same uh, angel. But just to give you an example here, um, my mom said she saw a ghost one time, <laughs> but but uh, uh, her husband also saw it, right? So they both saw the ghost. So normally I would think, okay, my mom said she saw a ghost, who cares? When they're both telling me that, that they were sitting there witnessing a ghost that stood there for several minutes, then I have to start thinking, uh, I don't know, right? I, the point is, I don't, I don't, I still don't, I, I don't necessarily believe that they saw ghosts, but I'm not going to discount it just because now it's, it's, you have multiple people saying the same thing, and with the resurrection, of course, this is, uh, this is, uh, it's far beyond that. Okay. Um, uh, that, that's the time we have. So right now you have three, uh, two minutes actually to respond to everything you just heard. Okay. Um, well, I mean, there's, there, there are stories, uh, and, and I come from a culture where, where there are stories of ghosts and demons and goblins um, that, that multiple people have gone to a haunted house and experienced the same thing, or, or something along those lines. Uh, I think the psychology in this sense, in terms of hallucination, is very, it, it, it's, it's very elaborate. So there's a lot of different types of hallucinations that people have. Um, and, and, and especially when there's communication that, oh, I saw this, I saw this. Like for example, the misinformation effect in social psychology, we know that that that, that this information can be fed into a person, and a person genuinely believes that they saw something that they believe it not. And this is something that 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 that's been researched uh, in social psychology. I mean, there's there's peer-reviewed articles for for things like the misinformation effect. Um, I think that that it, because when we're talking about hallucinations, when we're talking about visions, we're talking about brain chemistry, we're talking about if it's an external entity that, that that light is going to reflect off of that entity and it's going to go through the retina and create an image inside the brain. If it's not there, then it's very in brain chemistry that's causing it. These are the only two types of visions that we as human beings know of. There's no there's no additional explanations for it. Uh, and this is something that we can do the fMRI scans on the brain to, 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 to actually observe that these are the two types of visions that human beings have. Um, this, this third phenomenon of, of beings being uh, present with, with, with no variant brain chemistry or, 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 and yet there's nothing external to, 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 to their presence um, is, is simply unheard of. And so what I'm saying is that special pleading is when in all of the known cases that we have that these things are, hallucin that, that these things are hallucinatory. But in this special case, it's not, and that's that special pleading. Oh, okay, that's great. That's fine. Thank you for that. Um, so we'll now move into the third portion of the debate, which is the audience questions that, that we've collected. If at any point you want uh, another card, or we might even go to raise their hands, but if you still have your card, you haven't passed it in, feel free to write a question and just pass it up to the front to Sydney or myself, and it, it might still make it in if we have time. Um, so the uh, first question is for David from audience. And it's rather long, but it says, uh, my question deals with the great assumptions of this debate. Um, the great assumptions. Uh, this debate is not, uh, this debate is not. The, cor the core of Christianity is not that Jesus died and was resurrected, but that the God of Jesus is a universal God of all people and his teachings and judgments apply to all. Why is it that an occurrence that confounds human definitions of truth and certainty uh, confirm or justify a worship that condemns people to damnation and others to paradise and unity with God? Uh, isn't, it a, isn't a miracle like a resurrection just something we cannot explain and why should the human limits of truth be the basis for judging people? Um, well, there's a, there's a, there are a lot of issues in there. Um, I want to point, as far as the, 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 um, the topic of the debate, um, the, uh, most of that would be irrelevant. I'll go ahead and take a crack at it, but I just want to point out that most of it would be irrelevant. Uh, the question is, you know, whether Jesus rose from the dead, uh, whether that confirms Christianity or whether that uh, establishes Christianity uh, is at least a, 
conceptually separate issue. Um, if someone rose from the dead, um, that is a separate issue from whether uh, what else this issue does. And so, you know, questions about you know condemning people to hell and stuff based on this, uh, those are somewhat separate issues. But uh, think about what think about what this is is claiming that the purpose of Jesus is to just you unite all people and so on. And uh, his, me his central message isn't about um, isn't about his death and resurrection. I mean, where where are you getting this? I mean, it, I mean. <laughs> In other words, if I sit back and I say, here's what I like, here's what I would like Jesus to be. I would like the central message to be about just uniting all people. Um, therefore, that was Jesus' message. And, uh, you know, enough of this crucifixion, resurrection stuff. Uh, do we just get to define people uh, sort of in our own image like that? Well, the problem is we have historical records about Jesus. Uh, we have the historical writings from that time. We have the message that his followers went out and preached. And in the book of Acts, where we see Jesus' original followers going out, um, they always centered their message on three facts. One, Jesus uh, died on the cross for sins. Two, he rose from the dead. And three, he claimed to be uh, divine. And so if that's the message Jesus' followers were taking away from him, uh, I think you just, you can't just say, but I don't want Jesus to be that, therefore I'm going to say he's something else. Um, in other words, if you want to deny that Jesus is who he claimed to be, or what the early records say, then just say he's a nutcase, or just say he's a liar, or just say he's demon-possessed, or say something else like that. Um, you know, don't rewrite, don't rewrite Jesus in your own image. So you, we have the message, we have the message, if, you know, you have the ability to accept the message or, or not accept the message. I accept the message because it was confirmed by miraculous revelation. Um, so, and, and the difference between Jesus' message and everyone else is this uh, is this core miracle. In other words, if I'm going to listen to anyone tell me about God, I'm going to listen to the guy who rose from the dead. So I'm going to listen to Jesus, but if I'm going to listen to Jesus, I can't sort of tell Jesus what I want him to be and then demand that he be like that. Uh, I have to let Jesus speak for himself, and as the one who rose from the dead, um, if anyone deserves to be able to speak about God, it will be him. Thank you. All right, uh, Farhan? Uh, this one is, is more so for you. Um, it, said, it, it mentions that if, it, if, it, if the re resurrection is true, that's clearly a demonstration of God's power, but you've objected that if there is a God, he would have done it in a better way. So it's, it's asking for specifics of hypothetically, like if you were God trying to reveal yourself, how would you do it in a better way um, specifically than what we see in the Jesus name? Yeah, and that was kind of what David asked me uh, earlier as well. I think that David had that same question. I, I think that, that, that it's unfortunate that God has to play hide and seek in, 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 to begin with. I think, I, I think that, that that's a bigger issue to me. Uh, and, and not only that, but why does God want, want to be recognized or worshipped in this way? It seems a little bit narcissistic. It seems arrogant. I think that if there is a God, that there's that there has to be a better purpose than simply believing in an entity that created us. There has to be a story of growth and, and transformation, but that's not what the Christian message points to. It points to a doctrinal acceptance of, of a resurrection that pleases God um, and, and allows you to, to avoid an eternity of suffering. That type of message has, it, it just doesn't resonate with, with how I experience life. When I experience life, I experience love and compassion and empathy between human beings. I, I feel that I have a connection with human beings in nature. That, that resonates more to me, and I think that, that this, this miracle production that people are looking for um, from God to convince people that he exists, is, is, it, it, it's, it, it's a silly game of hide and seek, and I don't believe that that's what divinity would be put into. Thank you. All right, uh, so for David says, uh, Jesus, so even assuming that the resurrection is true, uh, the question is something in effect of, uh, Jesus never completed all of the prophecies of the Old Testament. For instance, he never brought uh, all of the Jews back to Israel uh, after the Roman conquest of, of Jerusalem, uh, about a century after the resurrection. Um, and he never rebuilt the temple. 
and never brought world peace, never established the government on his shoulders, uh, such as what the, the, res the prophecies of the Old Testament said that the Christ figure would do. Um, so e even given, even if we start with the assumption that the resurrection is true, how do we still claim that Jesus is God, as the Christians say he is, in the wake of the broken prophecies we see elsewhere? Well, the, as far as uh, Old Testament prophecies, uh, this was one of the reasons that um, some people were rejecting Jesus. They had certain expectations about what the Messiah was going to do. Jesus isn't doing those things, therefore, whoever this guy is, he can't be the Messiah, and yet he's claiming to be the Messiah. What's, what's, what's wrong with him? Um, if, if, we, if we agree that Jesus is the Messiah, uh, and if we agree that Jesus rose from the dead, uh, the, the, the rest of it isn't, isn't hard to, isn't hard to, to put together. Um, so if, if Jesus rose from the dead, then his message would seem to have God's stamp of approval. Uh, Jesus says that he's the Messiah coming to bring the kingdom of God, uh, that he's going to go away and that he's going to come back. So any prophecies that had been fulfilled at the time of Jesus um, obviously going to be fulfilled uh, in the future. And that's why you have Jesus claiming uh, in the Gospels that he's going to come back and he's going to judge, uh, things like that. Now, if you reject the resurrection, I would say, yeah, he doesn't, he doesn't fit. Who cares what he said to begin with? But uh, if we're saying that because the question, it sounded like the question was, you know, granting the resurrection, how do we reconcile all these other things? Well, if we're granting the resurrection, then we're granting that he does have this divine confirmation. And therefore, what he says about returning and so on, that all, that all fits together. So once again, it, it kind of comes down to whether you accept the resurrection or uh, or not, as far as whether this fits together. Sure. Um, just just staying to the part of the question though, like the Old Testament prophecies do paint sometimes a rather different image of what we see of the historical Jesus. Though, for instance, he never established a power structure like the Jews thought he would, and the Pharisees thought he would. Um, he never brought about world peace, uh, things like this that that the Old Testament says the Messiah would do. Um, so, do, I mean, does that Shot, does that discredit Christianity in any sense? Well, I mean, no, because again, I mean, if, if we're talking about Old Testament prophecies, I mean, if you look at Isaiah 53, uh, I, I, I've sat down and read this to a Muslim who didn't know what I was reading. I said, who's this about? Oh, it's about Jesus. <laughs> and it's, it's written seven, 700 years beforehand, but it so obviously uh, fits with uh, Jesus' death by crucifixion. Um, that, that I'd say it's clearly about Jesus. As for other prophecies, uh, that don't fit. I mean, once again, Jesus said he's coming back to judge. He is coming back to, uh, to, to, to bring peace and so on. And so uh, if, if those sorts of things, uh, let me put it this way. If someone's going to say Jesus didn't fit those things when he came, therefore that's a problem. Well, the only people who are going to be concerned about uh, Old Testament prophecies not being fulfilled in the Messiah would be, would be the Jews. And, but if you're an Orthodox Jew, you still believe those prophecies haven't been fulfilled. In other words, if Christians believe certain Old Testament prophecies haven't been fulfilled yet, Jews believe the exact same thing, that certain Old Testament prophecies haven't been fulfilled yet. There's no, there's no timeline uh, given on some of those prophecies when they're going to be fulfilled. So Jesus comes, and he's very different from what people expect, but he's obviously fulfilling certain things, and he says he's going to fulfill the rest. Um, the resurrection happened, then I have to agree with them. If it didn't, then uh, you know I see why you you would say it doesn't fit. Gotcha. Thank you. Um, most of the questions were for you, David. So I'm going to this will be the last question of this section, and we'll move into the closing statements. Um, so this is based on something that Farhan mentioned in, in one of his, I think, in perhaps his opening statements, and it says, "What are your opinions on the literary significance of the images in the Gospels?" Uh, he mentioned that they were uneducated fishermen who produce these very articulate, very uh, you know, literary, like very uh, noteworthy pieces of historical work. So, uh, is it possible that a group of well-read scholars gathered to write the next Aeneid? Um, no, I, 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 I didn't get to this, but I completely disagree with uh, Farhan's description uh, of, of the Gospels. Uh, the Gospels are exactly what you would expect, given the people who are, who are claimed to have written them, with the possible exception uh, of John. So Mark, we don't have much of a description of, but he seemed to be a, a well-to-do young man, um, a traveling companion of, uh, of, of Paul and Barnabas and so on. Uh, so you know, he, he, did, he didn't seem to be some dumb, educated, uneducated person. Matthew was a tax collector. He would have had some education. He had an official. He wasn't a fisherman. He was, he was a tax collector. This was a businessman 
Um, he would have been used to taking notes and so on like that. It wouldn't have been difficult for him to uh, keep track of the events of Jesus' life. Luke was a physician, would have been extremely educated. Luke was a physician. So he would have been extremely educated, and I don't think it's a coincidence that this is uh, some of the best Greek in the New Testament, and then we have the book of Acts, uh, which even, uh, even non-Christian historians uh, agree is very well written uh, history. That's exactly what we would expect uh, from a very well educated person. So the only question as far as the Gospels are concerned uh, is the Gospel of John, is the Gospel of John itself, which, which does claim to be written. Uh, by a fisherman. I don't necessarily associate being a fisherman with, with being dumb. Um, I, don't, I don't. You could be the smartest man in the world and be a fisherman. Jesus was a carpenter. Um, super, super intelligent uh, person. Um, so uh, you, I don't associate being, uh, uh, being a fisherman with, with being dumb. Uh, but at the same time, if we're, if we're, speaking, if we're speaking critically, um, there are lots of scholars out there, and there are even Christian scholars, uh, who believe that um, that the, based on some of the things that, that, that are said at the end of the Gospel of John, that, that, um, that the Gospel of John is actually sort of John and John's followers uh, putting this together. Uh, and we know that throughout the New Testament they had, uh, they would have scribes, right? So lots of times Paul would sign the, sign the letter in his own hand at the end, but he's, he's dictating uh, to a scribe. And so it, it wouldn't be a problem for someone like John to be you know, dictating this to to his followers who are then compiling the book of John. But I don't see any I don't see anything in uh, in the, the Gospels that would be inconsistent with the people who, uh, who they're attributed to. Thank you, uh, Farhan. Uh, to conclude, would be your response to that uh, about the the apparent discrepancy between the lifestyle of the men writing the Gospels and the li literary elements that we see as a result of their work. Um, well, I mean the the, the, the bigger issue with the Gospels is that we don't know who, who authored them. Um, well, what I was speaking to when I was talking about uh, Jesus' disciples with it, in terms of being fishermen was that these, these were the types of individuals that were following Jesus. These were the types of individuals who were susceptible to beliefs uh, like these, uh, like, like the beliefs that Jesus was preaching. Um, and so, so when, I, when, I, when I'm talking about low education, when I'm talking about the primitive cultures, what I mean is that this, this is a type of culture and these are the types of people that were susceptible to these kind of belief systems. Um, for Peter, and I think, and, and, and uh, Peter's actually identified as being a little bit um, in, in the book of Acts. And so, and so there, is, uh, there is a level of, 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 of illiteracy here. Yeah. But, but more important than that, I think that there, there, there was that there was a bit, that there was a connection between these disciples. They were tired of the Roman Empire. They 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 they, they wanted to rebel against it. For example, um, uh, Judas was a zealot, right? Oh, no, um, yeah, Judas was a zealot. It's described as a zealot. They had problems with with the Roman Empire, and so they they had an additional reason to come together and and, and follow Jesus um, as well. And so, I mean, I wasn't trying to do that to belittle the followers of Christ, I'm, I'm simply trying to say what, what these types of people were obviously susceptible, susceptible to. Okay, thank you. Um, that will conclude the question period. So, Barhan, you got the first word. You'll also get uh, the first word now. Uh, you have six minutes for your closing statements. Uh, yes. Oh, did I get the first? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so the question tonight was, um, did, did Jesus rise from the dead? Is this something that, that, that we as, as, a, as an educated 21st century uh, people, is this something that we can come to believe in? Is this sufficient evidence for us to believe in the God of, of, of Christianity? And, and I would argue that this is the strongest argument that Christianity has. Um, I agree with that, and I think that it is something that we should be contemplating over. This is something that we should be uh, thinking about in terms of intellectual pursuit. And I will go even go to the next step if you're open to it. And as an agnostic, I am praying about that. And so that's something that that Christians have have definitely opened me up to uh, more. And, and, and I appreciate those prayers. And 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 um, and I, I do think that this is not something that that, we, that even I personally can just. Uh, Case closed. Um, I think that the, that 
that the way that the Christians paint the picture of, of, of or how the Old Testament, excuse me, the New Testament narrative explains uh, the scenario of, of the resurrection is interesting because according to the facts that are there in the narrative, it would seem that 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 it's plausible that Jesus was resurrected from the dead. Um, my I I have I have problems with. The, the inerrancy issue of the Bible. There's different there's different accounts in terms of what happened, how many men were there, how many people, whether it was angels or two men, how many women went to the tomb. And so there, there, there's issues with the narrative that, that, that David did not touch on. Um, but the, the bigger thing, again, for the skeptic is, is the miraculous nature of this, of this event. And that's something David and I agree on. And, and the, the question that, that the skeptic has is that that if there are other explanations that, that we have, whether it's hallucinations, whether it's people making up stuff, whether it's, a, whether it's a stolen body, or whatever the theory might be, if, there's an, if there are other, other possibilities, then we would prefer those possibilities to, 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 to the miracle, which we define as the, the most improbable um, um, possibility of all historical events. And so David and I debated the problem of evil yesterday, and, and, and one thing that he, he said that these are all theodicies to explain why God would allow evil. These are all possible reasons why God would allow evil. And so what, well, in, a, in, a, in a similar instance, I would argue today that these are all possible scenarios in terms of what happened 2,000 years ago. Um, um, and, and that we should be open to them in, in, in the same sense, and that we should prefer those that 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 uh, conform to reality as we know it, uh, that that conform to the reality of science and empiricism and falsification um, and, and modern technology. And so, I mean, I do think that there that there are other explanations. I I do think that if people are claiming to hear things and see things that other people generally are not seeing, that they are hallucinating. Um, and I think that these are reasonable explanations for what for what went on um, 2,000 years ago. Uh, thank you, NYU and crew, and David Wood again, and thank you guys for coming. Peace and love to everyone. <laughs> If you guys could take out your contact cards and comment at the very end about who you think has been the most convincing while he is giving his concluding remarks, um, then we'll collect them after he's done. So yeah, yeah just write the entire time I'm giving my closing. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly. Multi task. Or, or at the end, you can be as respectful as you like, and then write at the very end. Um, but please, like, at least give him your ear. If you can, if you can multitask well, then write. If you can't multitask well, then prioritize David and listen and write later. <laughs> Have I got six minutes? Uh, about, yes. All right, well, uh, Farhan said something interesting um, at the beginning of his uh, conclusion there, and it's something that's been uh, coming up. He, he, he said that, that the issue here is whether uh, this miracle is sufficient to establish the truth of Christianity. And in, in, in that vein, throughout this debate, he's been saying things like, couldn't God have done something more? Uh, and I'm looking at this very differently. The question is, did Jesus rise from the dead? The, the question of what it confirms or how well it confirms it or could something else confirm it, those are, are different kinds of questions. So, in other words, Farhan is thinking, uh, I, I really don't, you know, I really have lots of problems with this Christianity thing. Now let me go and investigate the evidence for it and see whether it confirms all this stuff I don't like about Christianity. And obviously you're not, you're not, uh, you're not being unbiased there when you're examining the evidence if you're starting with the assumption that you really don't like this. Um, I'm asking a question, did Jesus rise from the dead? And I'm focusing on the evidence. Here's the evidence. Does the evidence confirm that he rose from the dead, or does the evidence leave it uh, open to open to question, or does it show he didn't rise from the dead? Uh, and then, based on the uh, based on the answer to that question, whether he rose from the dead or didn't rise from the dead, or we just don't know, then now what are the implications of this? And so the implications of Jesus rose from the dead. The evidence establishes that, therefore, it confirms his message, not the other way around. We don't want his message confirmed, and therefore, now we're going to go and uh, come up, try and come up with some alternative explanation. And what is the alternative explanation that we've been uh, offered here? Um, I'll just ask, uh, why do you believe I'm here right now? Um, why do you believe you're, that I'm standing here speaking to you? 
Uh, if Farhan is correct, you could all be hallucinating right now. We could never know that any, that we could never know that I'm here right now. Uh, because it's possible for all kinds of people to see the exact same thing. Look, if I were not here right now, and you were seeing it, it would be in your own mind. It would be in your own mind. That means that the person sitting beside you is not seeing it. Why? Because it's in your mind. It's in your mind. If everyone is seeing it, if everyone's witnessing it, then it's not just in your mind, it's something out there. And what we have with Jesus' disciples, and some foes even, is that they were all seeing Jesus risen from the dead. How do we explain that? Um, I've never seen an explanation that fits the facts other than Jesus' resurrection from the dead. Uh, Farhan says... Uh, that last night in the debates, I said, hey, these are possible explanations. We're using possible in, in different senses here. Uh, last night when I talked about uh, various theodicies, I'm talking about plausible reasons that God might allow uh, suffering. Farhan, it seems, is, well, this is logically possible, right? There's no contradiction in saying that lots of people all were hallucinating the same thing. True, there's no contradiction. It's logically possible in that sense. Uh, but it's so radically improbable that it's just, it's not something I could ever take seriously. Not when there is a perfectly good explanation on the table that accounts for all the facts and does so without any kind of strain uh, given the evidence. Um, Farhan has said um, that God is playing this silly game of hide and seek. And uh, I'm concerned about Farhan's view of God, that, that God is sitting there thinking, you know, how am I going to convince these people? Oh, let, let me perform a resurrection. Oh, that's not working very well. Oh, how can I do it? I just can't come up with any way. Uh, that, that's, 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 that's not how things work. I mean, if you take the, the Christian story uh, as a whole, human beings have decided to rebel, and God says, in effect, okay, if you're going to, if you, if you have decided to live on your own, I'm kind of... I'm going to leave you on your own, but I'm going to give you uh, some signs here in case you would like to uh, like to come to me. Um, that's kind of the message, not, oh, oh, how am I, how am I ever going to convince these people, and I, I just can't do it even though I'm all-powerful. It's not, it's, not uh, it's not the message. Um, on the issue of the Gospels, he says, we don't know who wrote the Gospels. Absolute nonsense. Absolute nonsense. Uh, we, know who, we, know, we know who wrote the Gospels. Those are the names that have uh, traditionally been... Uh, attributed to them. It was in the second century, but these are the followers of, uh, these are the second and third generation Christians here, so you can be skeptical about that, but if you're going to be, if you're going to be uh, skeptical about the authors just because it's Christianity, be consistent. Um, doubt Homer, doubt uh, Plato, doubt all of these, doubt all of these people wrote these things. If we're just going to say, you know, even though we have evidence for it, uh, even though these are the names that are attributed to it, we're going to uh, just reject him. Um, he says, I didn't respond to his complaints about um, contradictions in the Gospels. Well, that's because I explained in the beginning. I'm, I'm approaching them as I did in the beginning when I became a Christian. These are historical documents. Um, and actually, that caused a, that was one of the reasons I started trusting them in the beginning, that, that I saw differences. Because before that, I believed these guys got together and invented a religion. And then I start seeing differences in the narratives, and I think, wait a minute, these are not guys who got together and invented a religion. Otherwise, they would have, you know, had these uh, identical stories. So it was actually something that made me start trusting the Gospels more in the beginning as historical documents. As far as inspiration and whether these are actual contradictions, you can find harmonizations of the Gospels pretty much anywhere. You can go on Google, you have books on the harmonizations of the Gospels. I've never seen anything that's really a clear uh, contradiction uh, in these resurrection accounts. And finally, um, Farhan says that love resonates with him more than this uh, Christian message about uh, you know, brutal judgment based on you know, adherence to a particular uh, doctrine. Uh, Farhan, if love resonates with you, I don't, I don't know how you're looking at this story, right? Um, if, I don't know how you're looking at this story about what happened. Uh, at Jesus' crucifixion and his resurrection. The idea, I'm not saying you need to agree with it, but I'm saying if your focus is on love, what greater love story has ever existed in the world than that God loved us so much that he was willing to pay the price for our sins, that he was willing to enter creation and be beaten and tortured and killed for the sake of the people he loves that much. You can say you don't believe it, you can say it's all nonsense, but don't say that this story is not about love. It's about love uh, from beginning to end. And when we add the fact that all the evidence we actually have only confirms it through, uh, through the resurrection of Jesus, uh, I'd say, Farhan, time to drop your agnosticism. <laughs>
Please thank our guests.